in there, will you? Well, good morning, Bright Eyes. Hi, dear. Mm. What's all this picture book layout on the breakfast table? Are you expecting guests? Mm, I thought it might just start our day off brightly. What's uh, with the pajamas? Well, to be frank with you, I'm so hungry. I already got dot hair as soon as possible. Hey, pour me some scalding coffee, would you? Mm -hmm. I'm freezing. Mm -hmm. I've been halfway up to the North Pole all night. North Pole? I could swear I saw you in your half of our identical twin beds last night. Oh, yes, in the flesh, maybe. But, hmm, good. But I was off on a dreamboat, away on a fishing trip. Like no fishing trip in this world. Hey, you've got a raggedy little piece of burned toast there? Mm, help yourself. Oh. How about a couple of uh, burned eggs? They go pretty well with burned toast. Ha uh ha, -huh, and a hoe. <clears throat> Where was I? Something about a dream. Uh... Oh, 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 a map. Oh. Well, in this dream, there was a big map painted. What's the matter with the cereal? There was a big map painted on the wall and a stepladder. What goes on, I said. And in walks Robbie, out of bed in his pajamas and carrying a can of paint and a brush. He showed us where we were going. Hold it. I'm lost already. It's pretty fuzzy, but I'll start over. We got in a plane. We dipped a silver wing over New York. We zoomed up to Toronto. We changed planes and landed at Windsor, across the river from Detroit. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Canada. Anything to declare? <laughs> I can't describe the map to you, dear. It was just a little crazy. Anyway, we arrived at Winnipeg. Robbie just uh, painted us right to the spot. There was nothing to it, the way he did it. And at Winnipeg, we changed planes again. It seems to me you went shopping and almost missed the flight. <laughs> I couldn't have been that lucky. Hmm. From Winnipeg, we flew north, way up into Manitoba. Lots of lakes and islands. Very fishy-looking country. I asked the stewardess to open a window and slow the plane down so I could troll for trout, and guess what she said? Mm, I know. No trolling permitted below 20,000 feet. Now, how did you know that? Mm, I fly a lot. We sat down at Lake Lynn, Manitoba, and there was a big old PBY waiting to pick us up, charter job. Only way we could get where we were going. Robbie painted us a red line northwest across Reindeer Lake and started down the ladder for bed. And we moved out of Lynn Lake full throttle. The pilot just seemed to head for a big trout. And that's how we got to Waterbury Lake. Obviously, you were reading the National Geographic in bed again. No, dear, that was a couple of nights ago. Well, anyway, our big tub sat down on some sky blue water. It was an eyeful. We got a mixed reception on the shoreline. I heard a duck complaining. Something like, let's clear out of here, girls. This place isn't big enough for that bird and us. And a grumpy old seagull gave us a cold, fishy eye. 
but the real gripe seemed to come from a black bear. A guy can't take a little nap after dinner around here without a lot of racket falling out of the sky. That sort of stuff. Going ashore reminded me just a little bit of Washington crossing the Delaware. A fellow named Jackson owned the place, quiet, friendly, and his wife helped run it. Funny thing about it, I could hear a public address horn in the background telling Jackson's story of how he came to the very top of Saskatchewan and found this little paradise in the wilderness. He flew over this country with a canoe lashed to a pontoon of the plane, and he liked what he saw. So down he came. He paddled all over the sparkling lakes and bobbed his way along the swift water rivers that tie the lakes together. He liked it more than ever when the fishing turned out to be better than fiction. Big fish, willing fish, and lots of them. And there were almost hidden passages between some of the lakes. Lakes fringed with lovely forests. And there was crisp climate, too. This was for him. I must have arrived in waders carrying a fly rod, because right off the bat, I was fishing for Arctic grayling in a beautiful stretch of fast water between two lakes. Well, let the dog out before he breaks down the door, will you? Yeah, well, just a second. Hey, here, boy, come on, easy there. Your paws are all muddy. Oh, he was born with muddy paws. By the way, what's an Arctic grayling? To tell you the truth, I don't know much about it. It's a cousin of the trout family and hangs around the Mackenzie River system, Alaska, around up there. I read about grayling, but never saw one alive before. But I caught a barrel full of them last night. Great scrappers. They took a dry fly every time I put one in the water. You know something? In this dream, I was 20 years younger. I wore an old red sweatshirt I used to own, and I had all my hair blonde. Hmm, the boy I married. Hmm. I was a pretty good fly caster in this dream. Very relaxed. Had a small audience. You know how fishermen are always saying they want to be alone? But they really don't mind having a witness around when they're taking fish on every cast. I can still see those grayling. Purple gray and silver sides. A big dorsal fin like the sail on a toy boat. And ventral fins with necktie stripes. Oh, uh, speaking of neckties, uh, can Jimmy Brown wear your neckties for the senior prom tonight? I guess so. Tell him to take the knot out before he throws it back in my closet. Oh, that grayling fishing. I have all kinds of memories of that dream, if you can have memories about a dream. But it just got more and more hectic. Cast, float the fly, bang, fish in the net, show it off. Lose one, take another one, hook out, land another one, a little nature study. And then I posed for Sports Illustrated. Field and stream, sports of field, and outdoor life. They were bidding against each other for my biography. Mm. Oh, yes, there was a lady angler in this story but not the kind that catches bigger and better fish than all the men. She actually made sounds like, um... Oh. Yeah, that's what I mean. Was I the lady? No, no, you turned into a rainbow as soon as we got there. Not a rainbow trout, a real rainbow. Mm, I get it. Something distant, dazzling, and uh, out of your way. I can see your subconscious mind working in this dream. What did you turn into? Well, they served up a baked ham. No. Oh. No remarks, please. And I turned into a glutton. The next morning, a crew of lumberjacks chopped our cabin down. Sounded like it anyway. And there was some bird under my pillow. 
somebody dropped rocks in a box outside the window it turned out to be beef and turkey and all kinds of good stuff going into the freezer you should have seen the breakfast i dreamed up cooked it myself over a fire hot enough for well <clears throat> my old scoutmaster wouldn't have passed it for a merit badge one minute I was drooling over breakfast, and the next minute I was connected to a lake trout longer than my arm. The bear didn't like it. Hey, that's my fish. Maybe so, maybe so, <clears throat> but I had it. Come to think of it, it was as long as my leg. How long? Well, put it back, the bear said. Mm, I figured, what did I have to lose? I went along with the bear. I put it back. Then it was time to eat again. You know, you know how you can do something in a dream you can't do when you're awake? Well, I knew how to fillet a trout. No kidding. I never did it in my life. I whacked it up into hunks the size of paperback books and sliced an onion over a whole frying pan full of it. Delicious. Mm, how about cooking dinner tonight? Wait, wait. I started to eat the trout and it turned to fried eggs. I bet the yolks were too runny. You already said that. Zing. Right after lunch, another lake trout. Nothing to it. I just threw a spoon out of the boat and this big laker retrieved it. Oh, we didn't want to bring it right back, understand. I had to put a little pressure on it. Were you still wearing your red perspiration shirt? <laughs> Never took it off. Well. Somebody cranked an outboard motor, and we hit the riffle into the next lake. This voice came at me from the trees. Say, Buster, have you ever been attacked by a school of Great Northern Pike? I couldn't remember, but I didn't want to sound chicken. So I shrugged like an old Marine sergeant. I said, plenty of times, boy, plenty of times. And right away, the pike attacked. I just threw them a spoon and hung on. The second one I tangled with grabbed a lure that looked like something a witch doctor made up to cure the heebie-jeebies. There seemed to be some company in the boat with me, and the hardware was flying wild and flashing in the water. My boatmate hooked one, and we had a brother act going. Then I posed for all those outdoor magazines again. They were watching my every move and telling me how to hold the fish, etc. I went along with it, of course, my usual modesty. Mm -hmm. Later on, I gave the photographers the slip and demonstrated a few secret techniques in the art of pike fishing. Naturally, I caught the biggest pike of the day. I played it for a while, emphasizing the proper use of the rod tip in wearing down a large game fish. Elementary stuff, you understand, dear? Nothing to it. Eventually, one of my students slipped a net under this monster, and I agreed modestly to pose with it. I remembered too late that there were no photographers present, and I thought, how unfortunate that this pike will not be recorded for angling history. You were still a rainbow, dear. Mm, of course. Suddenly, everything became very peaceful. Before you could spell Saskatchewan backwards, a hush settled over the lake, and I broke into music. You had your trombone along with you? No, a guitar. Well, you can't play a guitar. <laughs> I know, but you should have heard me. Way up in 
can a day grow and in a night there's a trout they say that's too big to take it's bigger than my little boy is they say it's bigger than my little boy is don't you worry boy your daddy's going to hook it keep the fire crackling cause your mommy's going to cook it bigger than my little boy is they say it's bigger than my little When I'm back from Canada, dragging up trout, take it on your plate, boy, and eat it inside out. It's bigger than my little boy is, they say. It's bigger than my little boy. And when you clean your plate, boy, and lie down on the floor, I'll put away my fishing rod for good and evermore. There'll be no trout bigger than my little boy is. No trout bigger than my little The odd thing was, the audience consisted of a bird, one oversized sandpiper with yellow legs. I thought it was pretty decent of this bird to be quiet and listen to high-class music. And I was just about to step out of the boat and introduce myself when the bird went into a ballet. You've heard of the Dance of the Mayflies, haven't you? Yeah, of course. You know, they soar over the water, dipping and rising. It's sort of a celebration of boy meets girl. Well, this yellow legs had its own version of the mayfly dance. It was making sure that there wouldn't be enough mayflies to start a waltz in a phone booth. All around it, the flies were hatching on the water and struggling to dry their wings and take off. And this hungry bird was gobbling them up as fast as they appeared, on the water or in midair. Really? Yep. Even in my wildest dreams, I never dreamed I could dream up anything like that. You lost me with that last remark. Yeah, I guess it was a little uh, fuzzy. Mm, I think maybe you could use another cup of coffee this morning, honey, after that dream. No, all right. I do want to be wide awake today. You know something, spouse? Mm -hmm. You said you would not do any Girl Scout cooking on this trip. Okay, said I. We'll fly your gas stove and your saucepans up there and build you a modern little kitchen right in the bush. Imagine a rainbow doing any cooking. Oh, yeah, I forgot. You were a rainbow. Mm, with nothing to cook in except a pot filled with gold, just like in real life. Yeah, well, it's awfully early in the morning for biting satire. Now, after all, dear, have I ever deprived you of anything in the 15 years we've been married? Uh, 16. Why can't you remember that? 16? Is it 16? Oh. Hey, I never do, do I? Uh, where, where was I on this dream now? Um, mm, I don't know. It's your dream. Oh. Food. Food, that's it. Oh, what food we had there. Mm. Every day, it was the chef's special on the beach. Mrs. Jackson not only caught her own lake trout, she dragged it ashore and went to town beside the fire. What's that aluminum foil you sling around the kitchen? A coal lab? Yeah, that's the stuff. She put the trout in that and poured the butter to it. It seems that in the dream, she drowned it in butter that she melted in a little homemade aluminum pan. She made a whole kitchen out of aluminum handy that way. Mm -hmm. Didn't she use any seasoning? Now wait, I'm not finished. Sure, seasoning. Onion, sliced up and down the trout from head to tail. And then I think, yes, a touch of salt and pepper. And, well, that was it. 
<laughs> you might say she rolled her own. Mm. Didn't she fix any side dishes? Uh, side dishes? Oh, sure, side dishes. Uh, she built a reflector oven right there on the ground with the fire's heat bouncing into a little lean-to. A sort of half tent. And in there, she baked a shortcake and heated up some biscuits she brought from the lodge. Oh, it was the real McCoy, all right. I'll get it. Hello? Oh, hi, Pete. Hmm? That's tough luck. Sure, sure. Right to your door. Yeah. Yeah, about 15 minutes. Okay. That was Pete. Mm. Jane ran him out of gas. Uh, he wants a ride to the station. See, I forgot where I left off. Where'd I leave off? Uh, shortcake and biscuits. Oh, yeah. Well, while they were baking, the fish was baking. And when Mrs. Jackson unwrapped that lake trout, the butter and onion smell floated out and around like a colored mist. And the violins began to play softly in the background. And I thought, any second, a waiter in a red velvet vest is going to bring a plateful of that to me. The music soared on on the wings of the gypsy violin. Gypsies in Saskatchewan? <laughs> yeah, dreams can get pretty far out in left field, remember. Well, it all ran together then, everybody eating. Suddenly there was a float plane offshore and a pair of game wardens. I heard somebody say they were looking for a fish hog in a red sweatshirt. Hmm, I wonder if I would have pointed you out if I'd been there. Probably. Anyway, I became invisible and the warden shoved off without me. And then it occurred to me that I wasn't guilty of anything. Oh, I kept a string of grayling, but only a couple of lake trout. I yelled at the wardens to come back and prove I was a fish hog. But they kept on going. And after that, everything got a little wild. You know, the way it happens in a dream just mm -hmm. before the end? A lot of people turned up. The woods were full of marching trout hunters. They even came out of airplanes and established a beachhead, piling out of small landing craft. The fishing just turned into a string of impressions, scraps of movement, trout eating spoons and getting the net. Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, three men in a streamlined tub. And one of them was me, patting a laker on the back and saying, go home, boy. But he wouldn't go. He took the same spoon, fought the same battle all over, and came in close to the boat and said, uh, uh, what did you just tell me to do? You know, that kind of funny business. There were trout all over the place. Some of them just torpedoes of color underwater. Some of them suspended in midair between water and boat. Trout, trout, trout. I remember two boats with four lake trout fighting between them. A rod bent in the shape of a fish hook under the weight and power of a big fish. The rod took a little and the trout took it back. The rod won a yard of line, and the trout won a foot. That's the way it went, just full of fish, color, water, splashing. I never had such a lovely dream. And there was one trout, I remember, with the light of sunset on it, very dark and wet, with a kind of a gold wash touching the curved line of its shape. When I'm back from Canada, dragging that trout, take it on your plate, boy, and eat it inside out. There'll be no trout bigger than my little boy is. No trout bigger than my little boy is. And that was just about the wind-up. 
we drifted down the lake for the last time. All of our duffel started down for the shore reluctantly in slow motion. The air was filled with regret. You could feel it. Oh, we said goodbye, of course, quickly. Goodbye, goodbye. Then we taxied away from shore a little piece and moved along towards some open water. We paused for a moment to take one last look at a lovely stretch of shoreline. Sun dappled, trembling in the breeze. And then we gunned the engines and took off. Hey everybody, uh, some of you can hear me, some of you can't. Um, am my back? I'm hoping that I'm back. Uh, so basically a cable just slipped out. Um, sorry about that. Uh, people on uh, YouTube, you probably still hear me. Facebook, I don't know what's going on. Um, we'll see. Um, okay, we're back. Woo! Uh, anyways, Trout to Dream About is actually an ad for, uh, aluminum foil. And there's a couple of films that I have that are totally in this genre, which is, let's watch somebody, a dude or a bunch of dudes, go on a f hunting or fishing trip, and we'll feature some products along the way. This one is a longer one. I have another one that's, uh, I think Fishing Marlin or Tuna? It's, it's basically out in the ocean, but it's also an ad for aluminum, Alcoa aluminum foil. And then I have one that's brought to us by, uh, I think it's Schaefer beer and, uh, batteries. <laughs> and it's called, uh, this is elk country, which I might show at some point in the future. Um, but it's a really odd thing. Like it's, you know, a 30 minute, whatever, 30 minute episode. It's not even, well, it's not a series, but it's a 30 minute short. And maybe they tried to show this on television. Maybe they tried for TV stations that, you know, just were hungry for content, free content. Um, it was probably shown at men's groups, uh, you know, probably Alcoa uh, sponsored events. Um, what's interesting is Alcoa's existence in the United States now is not manufacturing um, aluminum products. It's mostly dams that they own. Uh, and so there's a contentious dam in North Carolina, close to where I grew up in North Carolina, in, near Baden, where I went to school, that is owned by Alcoa. But supposedly the state is like, yeah, you don't own this anymore. And so there's this fight back and forth about, about that. Who owns it? And specifically, you know, does damming make it more difficult to capture trout? You know, so is it counterproductive to this trout to dream about? Anyways, it's a bizarre film. Uh, and I'm going to follow up with another bizarre film called The Eyes Have It. This is, I believe this is Dutch, but it was released in the United States through BFA. And uh, it has some interesting optical illusions and just general trippy visuals. Enjoy.
From appearance alone, it is almost impossible to distinguish these man-made eyes from a real one. Yet we know they are entirely different. The eye, often compared to a camera, is much more versatile than any camera man has built. The iris, or diaphragm, controls the amount of light entering the eye. The cornea and lens bend the incoming light rays so as to focus a small inverted image on the retina. Thousands of cells in the retina send electrical impulses to the brain, and we see the image. But what does this image tell us of the real world? A horse's eye sees objects differently from the way a dog's eye does. Likewise, an owl doesn't see the world the same way as a pigeon. And as far as we are able to tell, a chameleon's world appears different from a snail's. How do you suppose a snail would perceive this scene? The snail cannot distinguish between colors. Everything it observes has the appearance of blurred, dark spots. In contrast to the snail, insects have a highly developed vision. While man sees in whole images, a fly sees thousands of images formed by the many facets of its compound eye. But even the highly developed human eye is not perfect. Some eyes are far-sighted or near-sighted. Eyes are also affected by physical stimulation. He actually sees stars. Certain illnesses, as well as chemical stimulation by drugs, can also produce visions or hallucinations. These images, too, are real. But what do they add to our knowledge of the real world? Physical defects in the eye can also cause inaccurate vision. The physician uses a drop of atropine to enlarge the pupil. Then he locates defects photographically. A special camera photographs the retina, which is illuminated by flash. The strange and colorful interior of every eye is uniquely patterned with intertwining blood vessels and textured with sponge-like tissue. And because the eye in every living creature is different from that of every other creature, each eye registers reality differently. Whose eye, then, sees the world the way it really is? If a person can see numbers in these mixtures of colored dots, we say he is able to distinguish colors. Many people, however, are partially or completely colorblind. Their eyes do not respond to one or more of the primary colors. They aren't able to recognize this 5, 68, 8, or Every eye differs at least slightly in its sensitivity to color. But if we couldn't distinguish between colors at all, our vision would be seriously limited. And so would our grasp of the world around us. Being able to distinguish between colors is one way in which we determine the shape of an object.
The other way is to notice contrasts between dark and light. By manipulating lightness, darkness, and color, the artist can create patterns which the eye recognizes as something other than simply oils on canvas. A painter uses color as a means of expressing himself. To him, the color of an object is one of its most important qualities. But the draftsman sees objects in terms of light and shadow, line and contour. And the sculptor reduces a subject to its basic three-dimensional shape. So who actually sees everything in its entirety? We tend to see only that which relates to ourselves. We are never conscious of everything in our visual field at the same time. A person can walk down the same street many times, and each time he'll notice something different. And what about the images we see without the help of our eyes? Images in the world of dreams and fantasies, where real objects have symbolic meanings, where the real and unreal exist side by side. blind person, like the poet Homer, the world of imagination is the real world. Some say that Homer's blindness gave him a special wisdom, an inner vision. But unlike Homer, most of us must rely on our eyes for a great part of our knowledge of the world around us. How we interpret what we see will help determine our conception of reality. So <laughs> it starts off a little trippy. Uh, somebody pointed out that uh, the thing with the glowing, they're blowing the glass uh, eyes, eyeballs, um, is very reminiscent of another film called Glass, which is Dutch. And this was German, so I don't think it was the same filmmakers. Was this an homage, a ripoff, or it's just such a common trope that it just makes sense? I I'm not sure. Um, but then I forgot about just how insane it gets at the end. Um, this is part of a show I did called School Adelic, where it, uh, it's films that have, they're not about drugs, but they're certainly influenced by drugs. Um, oh, and I misspoke. Uh, there are Alcoa manufacturing plants in the United States. Um, handful of what it used to be, but they're still out there, including the one in Pittsburgh. Um, they also have a really awesome building in downtown Pittsburgh that is 
really quite stunning. Um, this next film is a Centron film. It's part of that series that uh, features troubled kids and we're, as students, are supposed to figure out how to fix them. Uh, and it's open-ended. It's called The Show-Off. was in a terrible fix. And I thought if I could tell you about it, maybe you could help us. Well, let's see. Why, we could start right here in this class. I remember it was just about a month ago, and Miss Baldwin was reviewing us for a quiz. Yeah. The quiz will deal with the feudal system in Europe. Now, you'll find this material on page 106 through... 136. <laughs> Jim. Yes, Miss Baldwin? Put it down, please. Put what down, Miss Baldwin? Jim. Yes, Miss Baldwin, all right. The next part of our quiz will deal with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. First, we will review the... Jim. <laughs> well, Miss Baldwin, this chair just suddenly collapsed with me. <laughs> Frank, help him up. Oh, hey, this this one is good. Getting me pretty dangerous, you know. <laughs> Jim, Jim, we can't have any more of this. If you can't settle down and ask your aides, then I'll have to ask you to leave the room. Well, Miss Baldwin, I haven't done anything. The chair just fell over with me. I don't see how that's my fault. That's enough, Jim. Jim Brewster was like that. He was really a pretty smart boy, I guess. But there was just something in him that made him always want to be the center of attention. Oh, I suppose some of us did secretly admire him for doing the things he did and still staying out of trouble, even though he did interfere with classwork. At first, what he did seemed amusing. But as time went on, well, let me tell you what happened next. It was the time of year for the junior class play tryout. Most of the kids had been weeded out, and only the ones who were being considered for parts were there. Surprised to see Jim Brewster? Jim had talent, and for a while we thought Mrs. Jackson was going to give him the lead. Mrs. Jackson directed the junior play, and she did it afternoons after school, on her own time. Sometimes I suspect it tired her out. All right, let's take the living room scene in Act Two. Marie, will you read the part of Lorna Dugan? Harry, you read the part of Henry Carter. Where are we supposed to start, Miss Jackson? We well, can start with Henry's speech there on the top of page 34. Look, Lorna, it's all right with me if you see other men, but sometimes I think. Henry, Henry, you know there's no one but you. The others are just faces. They don't mean a thing. Henry, do I really mean so much to you? Am I supposed to do what it says here? Yes, go ahead. You mean everything to me. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Jim, you seem to think you can read this scene so well. Let's see you try it. Thanks, Harry. Marie, you'll read the lines with Jim. Look, Lorna, it's all right with me if you see other men, but sometimes I think... Henry, you know there's no one but you. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, that'll be enough, Jim. <laughs> George, will you read the 
your lines with Marie? <laughs> look, look, Lana. <laughs> We'll go on with tryouts this afternoon. Well, you know, tryouts are over already. Well, what did you expect, funny boy? Jim's wise guy behavior was beginning to wear a little thin with those of us who were exposed to it. Poor Mrs. Jackson, who already had a headache, just couldn't take the one that Jim was creating for her. And so, the class play got off to a poor start. But enough wasn't enough for Jim. It seemed as though he just couldn't stop until he'd finally gotten us all in a bad light. I remember it was at a party at Martha Harvey's house. And they were just serving refreshments. <laughs> I'll just bet you you can't do it. I bet I can. I don't think you can. Okay, just walk. Maybe I hadn't better. Ah, I told you you couldn't do it. All right, I'll show you. Hey, look out! What's the matter? It's not the end of the world. I'll buy you some more glasses, Miss Harvey. Like you getting clumsy or something? You trip me. Oh, I'm just sick about this glass. I never will be able to replace it. I'm sorry, Mother. I don't know why you used your good crystal when you knew those young roughnecks were coming. Oh, I wouldn't call them all roughnecks. Well, a bunch of smart alecks, then. Daddy, most of the kids acted odd, and Jim and Frank didn't mean to break the glass. Well, maybe not. But it makes you wonder about kids nowadays. In my day, when you were invited to a party, everybody was supposed to act like ladies and gentlemen. You can see how things were going. At first, it was just acting silly, when most of us really wanted to review for that quiz. And then the teachers began to think of us as that class, because of the nuisances that some of the kids were making of themselves. And after the party, well, some of the parents began to wonder, too. But what happened later really cooked our goose. It seems Jim had practically run out of new ideas for ways of calling attention to himself in school. And so, one night, with the help of some of his friends, he hatched up this plan that was really daring, even for him. People were pretty surprised, all right, when they came to school the next day. Jim and his helpers had created a sensation. The big sign was about all you could see. And it was evident that someone was going to have a difficult and dangerous time getting it down. Some joke. Maybe some of the members of the junior class got a kick out of it. But some of the other classes didn't think it was funny at all. They thought it was an eyesore on the whole school. Our principal, I guess you know, was fit to be tied. But even worse was the way most of us in the class felt. That big sign, like a badge of dishonor for all the town to see. Yes, the word really got around about the junior class. And that's what made us mad. The word that got around wasn't a true picture of the junior class as a class at all. It left out the good things we did, the fine play we put on, the important things we learned, and all the studying we did. No, our reputation belonged to Jim Brewster and the little gang around him who still thought he was pretty funny. After school that afternoon, the principal called the officers of the junior class into a meeting. Several of our teachers were there. I'm afraid this class has put itself in a bad light. The stunt that was pulled last night has made it very embarrassing for the whole school and for me personally. I've had several telephone calls from people 
who want to know what kind of a school we're running here. And frankly, I'd like to know myself. What we want to know is, what's behind all this? There's nothing behind it, Mr. Scott. It's just a bunch of smart alecks showing off. There's, there's nothing malicious about it. Do you know who the ringleader is? Do you, Kay? Yes, we know. It doesn't take news like that very long to get around. You can understand my problem, can't you? As far as the people outside of this school are concerned, I am responsible for what goes on here. When some members of the class do something to disgrace the class and the school, it's up to the other members of the class to do something about it. Well, what can we do? Have any of you ever complained to these people who show off? Or do you really encourage them by thinking they're cute? Have you ever tried anything like ignoring them? Why do you suppose these people show off? Don't they have enough to do? You asked me what you could do. I think you class officers should get together and discuss this problem among yourselves and come up with your own suggestions. Then we'll meet here Wednesday afternoon and work this problem out together. Thank you all for coming. Well, that's where we stand now. In a few minutes, our junior class officers are going to meet with a faculty committee. If you were in our shoes, what would you do about the show-off? What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, so what are you kids going to do about this problem? Um, it's pretty fascinating. It's just not, it's not like, who's responsible for this? Let's hone in and uh, punish that one kid. Um, yeah, pretty great. Uh, thank you, Chris, for uh, donating uh, some coffee for us, keeping us caffeinated, keeping our brains sparkling with uh, caffeine. Um, I should say today I'm wearing... Uh, AV Geeks shirt that we had printed up a couple of years ago. Um, this is featuring an illustration of an artist, Jason Poland, whose birthday is today and who passed away last year uh, very early. Um, and um, very big fan of AV Geeks and also a very kind hearted person who did illustrations for The New Yorker, New York Times. Um, a bunch of other things is really a nice guy um, and would come to my shows in New York and um, featured me in a book called Every Person in New York City where he attempted to draw every person in New York City so I was excited to be in that book um, I don't know is there an interest in AV Geek shirts uh, I periodically print up new shirts um, traditionally they are either yellow with black or they like school bus or they are green with white, a white logo, kind of like a blackboard. Um, if there's interest in that, yeah, say something in the comments, and maybe I'll consider printing some more up. Um, it's I used to take them when I toured, but it got to be the point where I'm like, I'm carrying all these shirts, and I never seem to have the right size, but uh, maybe there's a way to do this via email um, so that I don't have to schlep a bunch of stuff around. Uh, anyhow, uh, so that Centron film was great, and I feel like one of the teachers shows up in a Calvin film, uh, Grapevine, like as one of the girls uh, in the secretarial pool. I could be wrong. I might have to look and do some comparisons. Uh, this next film is another one that uh, kind of s says to kids, like, hey, if you want to drive a car, you have to learn how to drive a bike responsibly first. And so, um, here's Bicycle Driver. Enjoy.
I've been asked to introduce this film because I really am an advisor to a junior high bike club and I really do teach traffic safety education full time. So I see the safety education problem from both viewpoints. Bicycles and autos can safely share the same roads. But the drivers of each must know and follow the same rules of the road, accept the same driving responsibility, and respect each other's rights. That's what this film is all about. Most of the film is self-explanatory. Where it isn't, I'll explain as we go along. Notice the stop signs. Operator's license today, sir. License? Since when do I have to have a license to drive a bicycle? Well, it's not required that you have an operator's license, but I do need some form of identification. What did I do? Mr. Jones, were you aware of the stop sign back at 15th Northeast and 135th? I saw the stop sign, but that's for motor vehicles, not bicycles. Well, it's also for bicycles. Bicycles are construed as being vehicular traffic, and you have to comply with the laws whether you ride a bicycle or drive a vehicle. You mean you're putting a moving violation on my driving record? No, I'm not going to issue you a moving violation, but had you caused the vehicle to swerve or stop, I would issue you a moving violation, but I'm going to give you a verbal warning and write a warning citation. Mr. Jones, I'd like to remind you to possibly review your driving habits. Again, bicycles are vehicular traffic, and you must comply with the rules of the road, just as other vehicles do. Thank you. A lot of bikes. My goodness, I didn't realize we'd have quite this collection. This boy is 14 years old today. He's too grown up for toy bikes, really? too young for a driver's license. For his birthday, he gets to pick a 10 speed. Toys are very good. I don't know how they are. As it stands, this is a daylight machine. Well, is it legal to sell a bike without lights and reflectors? Uh, most of our customers will be running this thing strictly in the daytime. For those who want to ride at night, we have a wide selection. Of Jim, can you bikes. guarantee me you're not going to ride this bike at night? Yeah, except for basketball practice. Uh, I might get caught coming home in the dark because it gets dark so early. She knows about bicycles at night. They can be invisible 30 feet from a car. Pedal flashers help. A big reflector helps more. This three-incher far outshines the taillight. More help. A white jacket and a leg light. Better yet, reflective cloth strips. Common sense says, the more the better. Well, then I don't want you to bring it home until you have lights on it. Okay. Can I help you here? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm interested in a bike for some touring and from going around to town, school, stuff like that. It's for my birthday. Okay, follow me over here. A bike should fit. Standing flat-footed astride, this bike's too small. This too big, dangerously so. This just right, an inch of clearance. Gear shifts. In a crash, these could spear you. Here, they're okay. Here, safe enough, but exposed to breakage. A bike that will carry things gets more use. Rear-mounted carriers don't upset the steering and balance. How's this set? Yeah, those will do. Yeah, nice and light. Yeah, they are. Okay. Um, I also like gear shifts move down here. Okay. And then a three-inch rear reflector, and then a rear carrier also. Okay. You should, should be able to have it for you tomorrow afternoon. Okay, thanks a lot. When the shop's finished with Jim's new bike, it's prepared for the kind of use its driver has in mind. But who's prepared its driver? Where would a common sense bicyclist go for this knowledge? Where motorists go, of course. Hello, may Hi. I help you today? Yes, I'd like to apply for a learner's permit. Fine. Have you studied our driving manual? Yes, I have. Fine. That'd be a two dollar fee then and some identification. No state lets people drive cars without preparation. There's the money. That's fine. The smallest line of letters that you can read clearly. They have to meet minimum physical requirements. E L D. They take driver's knowledge tests with electronic scoring. Having passed. This is your instruction permit. 
I'd like to point out that it is valid for six months. Mm -hmm. Also, that you must be accompanied by a licensed Washington driver with a minimum of five years' experience while operating a vehicle. Yes, sir, may I help you? Uh, yes, do you have a booklet that has uh, rules of the road in it? Yeah, the driver's guide, sir. A bicycle driver learns it himself or goes without. There you are, sir. Thank you very much. Probably because he risked no life but his own. Now at this next street, turn right. But examiners make sure that motorists qualify before the state issues licenses to drive alone in traffic. The young bicyclist must rely on his own common sense as to whether or not to ride in rush hour traffic. How you like it, Mom? That's a real nice bike, Jim. You're gonna have to mow a lot of lawns to pay for it. Uh, let's just put it in the car and let me go someplace and ride it. Okay. Oh, I'm just going over my hand signals. I'm going to go for my driver's license next year and might as well start learning about them. Just you hand signals. You can use them on your bike, too. What are you doing them for? Just driver's ed. You can learn how to drive on a bike. So might as well start now. Wait later. You want to follow me? Sure. hand signals have been standard since the early days of the automobile. It takes a little practice to steer and balance while using one hand to signal. That wasn't too bad, but we're too far away from the curb. Let's try it again. Just follow me here. For some reason, and this isn't unusual, Jim sets his mind on developing an adult skill, driving in traffic. On these quiet streets, he used to play with a high-rise bike. Now he works on good execution. Now he's working on left turns. Critical maneuvers for all drivers. In light traffic, he handles his bike just as though it were an auto. Here's the type of left turn that works where there's a lot of oncoming traffic. Notice how he stays on the right. That's part one of his left turn. Part two, he makes as a pedestrian. This way, he avoids stopping in the middle of a busy intersection. Once across, he takes to the street and proceeds. Planning a left turn at rush hour, he takes to the sidewalk, riding if it's legal, pushing if it's not. The idea is to cross two sides of the intersection as a pedestrian. He avoids riding through on the right because a lot of cars are making right turns. He completes his left turn without ever getting out in the middle of dense traffic. We call this defensive driving. When riding in a car, he begins to see driving behavior with new eyes. Yeah, I got a new game. Oh yeah, what is that? It's called What's He Pretending? See the guy in the green car up there? Yeah. What's he pretending? Oh, maybe that he's a race car driver. No, that he's a nine on a green horse. I'm bugging the peasants. Watch out, dear. There's some small children up in there. Drum, couple drum majors leading a parade. It's not legal what they're doing, is it? No, that's not legal. They can't block traffic. They can ride single file, but not too abreast like that. Look at that biker. I wonder what he's pretending to be. He's passing on the right there. He thinks he's a ghost. The road's big enough for him in the uh -oh. car, too. Now he's pretending his own stupidity is the other guy's fault. For crying out loud, what you trying to do? Kill me? Look out! I see him, but I just don't believe him. They're just pretending. Pretending? They're what? Mosquitoes looking for a windshield. Jim's learning. The question is, is he learning the things that will help him survive? Let's see. Hey, Dean, did you ever wonder how far the average driver can go without making a mistake? Oh, about 10 blocks. 
maybe 20 if he's real good. Four or five is below average. Jim has the green light. Why the slow signal? Say, that kid's quite a defensive driver. Here's why. A right turn on red, right in front of him. Hey, let's go get that guy. Please go down to the next intersection and turn right and stop. I'm just fed up with these crazy kids and their bikes anyway. Sir, you better be thankful that kid's a first-class defensive driver. Otherwise, he'd be on his way to the hospital, and you'd have more to be concerned about than this traffic citation. Hmm. Well, since when does a bike have the right-of-way anyway? According to the traffic code, bicycle riders have the same rights and responsibilities as a motor vehicle operator. 105th, and it's LA 55537. Okay, James, uh, if we need you, we'll call you. Okay. By the way, how'd you know he was going to pull that stunt? Well, I was watching him, and when I saw him about to turn, I pulled in. This is about it. Well, take it from a guy who's seen it all. You're some kind of a driver. Okay. Thanks a lot. See you, See you later. later. So, he's some kind of driver. Sure, when he's by himself, but in unguarded moments, he can forget it all. Just like, well, he said it himself. Mosquitoes looking for a windshield. See something we didn't? Come on, Jim. Well, hurry up. We'll never get to the park. Come on. Let's go. Come on, Jim. Move. In the middle of an arterial? Think it over, Jim. Are you going to use them for an alibi? Stay a kid? Playing in the street? Whether on a bike or in a car, to become a first-class driver, you either drive alone or you seek out company with the same interest. Okay, hey, here's Jim. Looks like he's got a new bike. Here, buddy. Hi, Jim. How's it going? Hey, this is Shattuck. got your new bike, huh? Yeah. Hey, that really looks nice. Thank you, thanks a lot. Uh, this is Shattuck. Is it too late to join the club? Well, it's it's too late for the trip that we have scheduled here. Uh, look, at, you've got to know the rules of the road, and we also have to have your parents' consent. Uh, I'm really sorry, but uh, hey, look, at, how about uh, next week? Uh, we've got a 25-mile trip planned. And uh, why don't you see me Monday, and I'll bet you we can come up with something, okay? Okay. All righty. Thanks a lot. Dave, take care of that new bike. Okay. Have fun. It's one thing to study for yourself. It's another when you know you'll be tested, and you'll be riding with people who really know the book. Hey guys, it's, it's getting time to go. Uh, Jim, our new members, are going to recite uh, what are the rules of the road? To promote safe and orderly flow of our traffic on our roads. Why should you follow the rules of the road? Because if I don't, I can't expect anybody else to. Oh, you mean we always follow the rules of the road? We, we try, but it isn't easy. Mosquitoes looking for a windshield. <laughs> yeah, the, all the wisecracking uh, going on about the uh, the other bicyclists is pretty pretty great. Um, what was I going to say? Can't remember what I was going to say. Anyways, uh, so this next film looks to be a, a fable or a kid's story, but it's brought to us by a banking association. So let's see what they're trying to tell us. This is a bone for Spotty.
for dinner. Hurry up, see. I've got a surprise for you. See? Oh, no. We finish our dinner before we have our food. Go on now, clean your plate like a good little dog. <laughs> That's better. Now you can have the bones. You're going to eat it? I don't understand dogs at all, especially... What don't you understand about him, dear? Eating his dessert, he just buries it in the ground. Why doesn't he eat? That's what I don't understand. Well, dear, I guess he just wasn't hungry after he finished his dinner. So he buried the bone. Then when he really wants it, he'll come back and dig it up again. Oh, he saves his bone just like I'm doing with a dollar I got from Aunt Sally. That's right. Why, I'll bet that Spotty has lots of bones saved all around us. And if I save a dollar that thing, then I'll have lots of them moon eyes. That's right, dear. Right back, Daddy. All right, honey. <laughs> Daddy, may I use your shovel? Sure, dear, go ahead. Barbara, what in the world are you doing? Saving my dolly, Daddy. Saving your... <laughs> by burying it? You said that how Spotty saves his bones. My dollar will be good and safe here. Oh, now, wait a minute, honey. We can't do everything that Spotty does. There are a lot of safer places to save our money than a hole in the ground. Why, even Spotty can't always find his bone when he really wants it. Look at that. He's already forgotten where he buried it. Where's the safer place, Daddy? Well, the safest place for us to keep our money is in a bank. You mean a money store, Daddy? <laughs> well, yes, but a bank really isn't like any other store in town. You see, in a bank, they don't actually sell things. Why, I saw Mommy buying some money there. No, dear, she wasn't buying that money. It was hers in the first place. She merely put it into the bank for safekeeping. Oh! You see, the bank makes a business out of keeping other people's money until they need it. Now, if I were a bank, you'd let me have your dollar. And I'd take it and put it in a very safe place. And then when you came to ask me for it, because you wanted to buy something with it, the bank would give your dollar back to you. And if you put one of those dollars into the bank every week, why, before long, you'll have enough to buy a lot of things that you really wanted. Hi, Dad. Johnny? Hi, Johnny. Hi, you sis. Guess what? We beat the Tigers, 27 to 2. Oh, that's great, Johnny. Look, I've got a dollar, and I'm going to put it in the money bank. Good for you, sis. I've just been explaining to Barbara about how the bank protects your money for you. Your brother puts money into his savings account every week, don't you, Johnny? I sure do. I bought my new bike with the money I saved up from running after school errands, and I've already got $4 saved towards that catcher's mitt. You get the counting every day? Of course not. They just write down how much you have in your bank book. Bank books have lots of pictures. Isn't that right? <laughs> no pictures. If we showed Barbara your bank book, she'd understand a little better. Sure, Dad. It's in my room. Come on, sis. Dad and I will straighten you out on the whole thing. You see, sis, when you first put your money in the bank, they give you a book. Like this, with your name on it. Then they mark down how much you've deposited. What's deposited? Well, that means putting the money in the bank. Look, suppose I was going to deposit your dollar in my account. I'll take my book down to the bank and fill out a savings account deposit slip. 
I put my name and address at the top, and then one dollar where it says cash. Then I'd take my deposit slip and my dollar over to the counter. But I'd also have to give the man my bank book so he can enter the date I came in and the correct amount of my deposit. Then the amount of my deposit is added to what I already had in the bank. And this total tells me how much money I now have in the bank. He gives me back my book, and I've got another dollar saved. And that's all there is to it. But I don't want my dollar in your money book. All right, sis, then we'll just go back to the bank and withdraw it. This time, instead of a deposit slip, I'd make out a different kind, call a withdrawal slip, to take one dollar out of my account. the bank would take one dollar out of my savings account and give me back the money. And there's your dollar again. Sit over here, honey. Let me have your bank book a minute, will you, Johnny? Sure, Dad. You see, dear, every one of these entries in Johnny's book shows how much money he saved in the bank each week. And if you save regularly, it doesn't take long for the money to grow. Now, in some schools, they have a special school savings program to help the students bank their money. And right here, it shows some extra money that the bank gives to Johnny that they call interest. Why do they give it to him? Well, they give it to him for saving his money in their bank. Sort of like an extra prize. You see, dear, the bank lends some of its money to various people for certain lengths of time. For instance, a bank will lend money to people who want to buy a home. Or to industry to build new factories. The bank will lend money to store owners to buy the things they sell to people like us. And to the government. And to pay people like firemen. And policemen. The bank charges rent for the use of the money they lend. Out of this rent money, they pay you interest. Or the extra money you get for saving in their bank. And the more you save, the more interest you get. And right here, it shows where Johnny drew out almost all his money to buy that new bicycle. Boy, I'll never forget that. Thirty-three dollars. And I had them give it to me all in dollar bills. So the stack would look a lot bigger. Gosh, I could hardly carry it off. <laughs> Daddy, may I have a money book too? Of course you can, dear. Tomorrow morning, we'll take your dollar down to the bank and open a savings account just for you. Gee, I have so much money, I can't carry it all. Daddy, look. Daddy found his bone after all. May we take him to the money bank, too? Sure, he can go along, but without the bone. Thank you very much. We're always happy to welcome a new customer. Look, Daddy, my very own money book. Um, <laughs> there's so much I can say about the banking industry, uh, here, um, but you guys already know it being adults, you know how it goes, what it's all about. Um, hmm. All right. So, uh, I have a choice of what I could show you, but I think I'm going to show you, this film is made 
I have films that are for specific niches. And this one, uh, I think I got this on eBay. But this is made for people that work in mail rooms um, and that manage mail rooms in light of in the 70s and 80s. Well, this film was made in the 70s. But uh, there was a lot of terrorism going around and a lot of uh, mail bombs being mailed. And this film is how to handle a sus suspected mail bomb. It's called Postmark Terror. And this is a restricted viewing, so don't watch this if you're not supposed to. Letter bomb, the parcel bomb, instruments of terror. The postal services of a hundred nations provide the delivery system for the terrorist bomber who sits safely miles away. Who are the targets? Any member of the establishment from a policeman to a corporate executive to a political official. From an ambassador to a labor leader, none is immune from the danger. The majority of letter bombs have utilized a pressure release system. When the envelope is opened, a cocked striker releases a firing pin, which ignites the primer and blasting cap, detonating the explosion. The average letter bomb has contained approximately two to five ounces of explosive. Just a big firecracker, right? Wrong. Military plastic explosive is most powerful. Here at the test site, a technician inserts a few ounces of plastic in a common envelope. This is placed in the center of two tires. For safety, the explosive will be remotely detonated. A bit more punch than a firecracker. The average government agency or large corporation will daily process thousands of letters and packages. How do you defend against such an insidious threat as the letter bomb? You must have a counter-bomb plan of which letter and parcel bomb defense is an integral part. A number one priority is to establish a central location for the receipt and distribution of all mail. The second priority is to institute manual and visual screening programs. All persons handling and screening mail must be trained to be alert for suspect letters and packages. What are some of the recognition points that in the past have spelled letter bomb? Be alert if a letter is soiled or stained or if there's a strange odor. Be suspicious if there's no return address. Another warning sign is excessive postage. Badly typed or handwritten letters are a cause for concern. Closely scrutinized mail from foreign countries. Special delivery letters and those with airmail labels. Watch for misspelled words, especially common words and names. Treat gingerly envelopes and packages marked with restrictive words such as confidential. Be careful when there's a mismatching of name and title, or if there's just a title and no name. An airmail letter that weighs more than two ounces should be cause for concern. Be extremely careful if there's rigidity, especially along the center length. Do not bend or flex such a letter. Be just as careful when an envelope is lopsided or uneven. If a wire or other substance is protruding, call for professional assistance. The odds are you have a bomb or hoax device.
Don't let visual distractions lure you into opening a book, letter, or package. Pornography, for example, has been used as a ploy several times. If you have any doubts about a letter or package, don't handle it. Call for professional help. Every mail room should have a wall poster which lists basic letter and parcel bomb recognition points. Receptionists and secretaries should have such warning material in compressed form, ready for instant reference. Such forms can also be distributed to potential targets and their families in high threat areas. Advances in battery and power cell technology have allowed a more sophisticated fabrication of mail bombs. Common letter bomb recognition points have been published all over the world and an intelligent bomber can construct a device which is difficult to detect solely by visual and manual methods. All mail rooms should have access to a suspected item holding area. Ideally, this should be outdoors, but since this is impossible in most facilities, the holding area should be close to the mail sorting operation. Do not carry suspected items through concentrations of people. If possible, select a room which has a window that opens on the outside of the building. If there is an explosion, this will assist in venting gases. In many modern high-rises, the windows cannot be opened. Therefore, the holding area should be reinforced with energy-absorbing materials like ballistic fiberglass, nylon, or Kevlar. There should be a protective container in which the suspect item can be held until the arrival of the bomb squad. A bomb basket is a functional container, as are sandbags and automobile tires if mobility is not needed. If a bomb blanket is used, do not let it directly contact the item. It is impossible for a bomb technician to see a covered package, and a pressure device could be set off when the blanket is removed. A plus factor in using a container, such as a bomb basket, is mobility. The suspected item can be remotely removed from a room or building. To illustrate the value of a containment device, a letter bomb will be detonated between a bank of fluorescent tubes. Note the lateral force of the explosion. An identical amount of explosive is placed in the netting of a bomb basket. Observe the explosive force being vented upward. Note the directional force of each explosion. An open vent such as a window will help dissipate upward blast energy. The so-called underground press assists radicals and the mentally disturbed by publishing easy-to-follow bomb-making schematics. The big brother of the letter bomb is the parcel bomb. It is most deadly since it can contain a considerable amount of explosive. A common type is the book bomb. This is a photograph of an actual terrorist bomb which was mailed to a prominent government official. And this is a recreation of that bomb. A box of fine chocolates, or a pound of plastic, or a stick or two of dynamite. An instrument designed not to intimidate, but to kill. This wrecking job was accomplished with just a little more than a half stick of 60% gel dynamite. A terrible amount of destructive force can be held in a small package. The parcel bomb is normally triggered when open. Can you spot such a deadly device? As with the letter bomb, there are recognizable clues. There's generally an excess of stamps, as the bomber wants to be absolutely sure of delivery. Be careful with a package that doesn't look professionally wrapped. Many parcel bombs have had an excess of securing material such as masking tape, string, or scotch tape. Be wary of a soiled or dirty package. If there's the slightest doubt, do not open it. As with the letter bomb, any sign of protruding wire, tinfoil, or any foreign matter is cause for isolating the item and calling for professional assistance. Manual and visual screening procedures involving trained personnel are the essence of a bomb countermeasures program but there are some valuable equipment aids to augment the screening process. 
Hunter bombs have contained some degree of metal, and all mailrooms should have at least one metal detector. X-ray is a most valuable tool, especially for parcel bomb recognition. It does require proper radiation protection and well-trained operators to know what they're reading. As with all equipment and procedures, you should obtain assistance from qualified bomb technicians prior to purchase. Explosive vapor detection equipment should be considered for high threat areas. This is sophisticated equipment, which also requires a well-trained operator. Dogs trained to detect explosives are excellent, but require special handling. Equipment is most useful, but the primary and initial emphasis must be on trained personnel. Ms. Jefferson, Ellie in the mailroom. I have a letter here from Mr. Jones, postmark London. There's no return address or company marking. Is he expecting any mail from the UK? Hold a second while I check. Ellie? Yes? Mr. Jones is expecting some correspondence from the Defense Ministry. This certainly isn't the letter. Sorry, he's not expecting any other correspondence from the UK. Thanks. I better have security check this one out. Security? Ellie in the mailroom. I think I have a suspect letter for Mr. Jones. Isolate it. We'll have someone down there right away. Check with the intended recipient of a letter or package. Are they expecting anything from the geographical area from which the item was mailed? If there is a return address and a name, attempt to verify the legitimacy of the sender. If you have a suspect parcel, evacuate the immediate area. Even with a hardened and vented holding room, there should be a partial evacuation of the surrounding area. Keep the location sealed off while awaiting law enforcement, fire, or security personnel. The salient points of an intelligent bomb countermeasures program are have a plan, work with security professionals and bomb technicians to develop a practical program to meet the bomb threat, train your screening personnel, all hands involved with mail, including those receiving mail, should be familiar with the known recognizable features that have been peculiar to most letter and parcel bombs. Wives in high threat areas should also be briefed on the danger. This can be done in an intelligent manner without breeding paranoia and hysteria. A woman will readily understand that an extra cursory inspection of mail and packages can help protect her family. In very high risk areas, it should be policy that no mail or packages are accepted at the door. No one but a qualified bomb technician should ever investigate a suspected item to the point of touching, probing, or opening. If there's the slightest doubt about a letter or parcel, treat it as a possible bomb. Don't open it. Don't handle it. Leave the investigation to professional bomb technicians. Above all, be alert and don't take chances. I was standing at my desk in the next department when it felt like the ceiling hit me. It was terrible. I got up covered with plaster and glass to try and find out what had happened. Then I could see there was no wall between the two offices anymore. It was horrible. Everything was covered with blood. Bodies lying everywhere. Some were trying to get up. Um, so, I actually have a couple of films that are made for corporations on how to deal with terrorism. Uh, I have one that's made for executives on how to survive a hostage situation, uh, which is fascinating. 
Um, and then I have a bunch of films about how to deal with bombs um, that I am probably not going to show <laughs> online, um, including one with Mickey Rooney, who plays a mad bomber, which is, is kind of fascinating. Um, yeah, so it's an interesting film that kind of captures what was happening, the climate uh, in the 70s, um, and kind of reminds us like, oh yeah, there were these kind of domestic terrorist things going on even back then. Um, so yeah, so what a wonderful way to stop the, uh, the show. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so these films are interesting because uh, they're this niche audience and uh, yeah. So everybody have a good weekend in spite of what you just saw. I hope it's um, nice outside. You can spend some time outside. Um, thank you everybody for contributing, buying some coffee for AV Geeks. Uh, I'm going to do some research to see about buying, uh, getting new t-shirts printed. So, um, uh, maybe next week I'll have an idea about that. Um, if you like what you saw, you can actually go right here and hit like. Well, you can't go here and right and hit like. You can hit like on whatever your UI is for Facebook or for YouTube or whatever you're watching. Uh, and you can go to avgeeks.com to um, watch previous shows. Uh, you can also donate and buy some coffee for AV Geeks. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in uh, today and this week and these last couple of months. It's always great to show these films um, to folks and getting their feedback. Um, and I will see you again on Monday. Everybody have a, a good restful weekend. Take care. Take care of yourself. All right. Bye.